All right, now we're going to go back to our regular uh, uh, meeting. Uh, we'll have a discussion of information items. Uh, our first uh, person up to discuss. Before you start, read the one sentence. Okay. Uh, at this point of the meeting, the Board of Education may request to add any additional discussion items. Anybody wants to add that? We will put that at the end of our meeting to discuss. No. Seeing none, we'll move ahead. So our first uh, uh, person uh, uh, up tonight on our agenda is Mike's Michael Zalewski, our 23rd District State Representative. Michael, welcome. Hey. And uh, please come in if you want to give, uh, give us a little sure. overview of what's happening in Springfield with us. Well, uh, <coughs> I think the, the perhaps probably the one thing that's most important and on everybody's mind is uh, the public pension proposal that was put forth by 22 of uh, my colleagues, including myself, uh, last week, House Bill 6258. Um, at the outset, I will tell you that I frankly expect a lot of gnashing of teeth and uh, tough questions from from this particular board and any school, suburban school board in my district about why I'd put my name to that particular piece of legislation. But I think it's helpful for me to go through the bill, explain why I co-sponsored it, and then, you know, hopefully I can, you know, we can have a, a good, healthy dialogue. Um, the bill basically does three or four important things. It adjusts the cost of living increases for um, state employees and teachers. Um, to limit it to 3% compound interest, but only to the first $25,000 in salary a public employee receives. The reason that's key and it's important, and it's, it's probably the most important part of grappling with this crisis, is compound interest on public pensions is what's causing, is the major cost driver of, of what we're dealing with in Springfield, this $89 billion shortfall. Um, there's no power, more powerful force than compound interest, so we simply have to adjust and grapple with it. It asks um, public employees to contribute two more percent of their salary towards the pension fund. It fixes some of the, it, it changes the retirement age so that if you're uh, a person between the ages of 40 and 45 years old, you, you are asked to work another year. If you're under the age of 40, you're asked to put in another five years. Um, if you're over the age of 45, w our feeling was that we, it's, it's inequitable to ask you to work any longer. So we, we try to be, try to create a sliding scale. For the t what we call tier two, which is what the legislation we put into effect in 2010 does, is we create what's called a cash balance plan, which is important and I'll get to that in a second for, for, for this particular board. Um, and we do some, so we fix some things that were wrong with Tier 2 when it was enacted. And it has the, sh the quote unquote shift. Um, the, the actuaries are working on the numbers now, but my understanding is the employer contribution would include about a half a percent per year, which if we're looking at a 12 percent, um, if we're looking at a 12 percent uh, contribution, would be phased in over 12 years. Let me say at the outset to this board that is very, very tenuous. Um, we are very, very aware of the sensitivity of 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 the shift, and in terms of how we're going, if if it were to be enacted, how we would phase it in. Um, so I don't want anything I say to be conceived of as in stone, but that's what the actuaries are looking at right now. And um, we would, the cash balance portion of Tier 2, which is all new employees, is important in the context of the shift because new employees would be able to take advantage of the cash balance, which is basically a hybrid of a defined contribution and a defined benefit plan. An employee would be able to utilize a defined benefit plan, however, they would be responsible for the market conditions and they would be responsible for managing the money. So it, it's a much, much uh, smoother way of dealing with uh, a defined benefit plan. So any new employee that the district like RB would hire could utilize a cash balance plan. So that's the, the basic rundown. Um, Prospects for passage, uh, the actuaries are scoring the bill right now. 
we, we hope to get numbers hopefully in the next week or two weeks. Um, assuming the savings are, are strong, we'll, we'll have a dialogue with, the, with labor and um, going into the January session, we'll see if we can, um, if we can come to some sort of agreement where we can, we can vote on the bill. Um, why I sponsored the bill. I, I was talking to your um, CFO before the meeting began. We cut $200 million out of the state budget for education in fiscal year 12. Um, I, Mr. Uh, McGinnis, and he, I won't hold him to this, he was, he, was, he was speculating, but it sounded right. He said he thought uh, GSA, which is how, what we pay per student pupil to RB, went down 9%. So that's 9% less money that we're able to help you guys with educate kids in RB. Simply put, our pension payment in Springfield is crowding out our ability to fund core state services like education, um, Department of Corrections, keeping bad guys in jail, um, transportation, and social services. We are unable to sustain the spending we have because the pension payment is getting big. That's no fault of the working men and women of Illinois or the working men and women in this district. And it's sad and unfortunate that it's come down to this, but we have to address it. So first and foremost, that's why I came on the bill. The next question is, why would you um, sign on to sponsor a bill that has the shift in it? And the answer to that is my feeling is at some point or the other, the shift is going to become the law of Illinois. And my feeling is my school districts would be better served by having their general assembly members be in at the ground floor and be able to do as much as he or she possibly can to make this as palatable as possible. Um, and the third question is why do we need to shift at all? This is your problem, not ours, and you are effectively dumping the pension crisis into our laps. That's certainly, uh, I acknowledge the merit of that argument, but what I will tell you is when people ask why the state is responsible for the employer contribution when it comes to the teacher retirement fund, nobody has an answer other than it's always been that way. And when you st have this kind of crisis and have these kinds of questions being asked, we always did it that way, just doesn't make the cut. So. We have to take a hard look at how we're doing this. We have to certainly help you. We can't just dump it in your lap. We have to make sure we do it the right way. But those are the honest answers, and I would be doing you a disservice if I, or and my constituents behind me a disservice if I didn't tell you the truth. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and uh, I thank you for your time. So, um, Representative Zalewski, um, you mentioned something that a lot of us uh, practice in the private sector pretty much, and that's defined contribution plans rather than defined benefit sure. plans, which, to, uh, check me if I'm wrong, it, um, provides four times the benefits to the amount of contribution by the participants. Is that a pretty good figure? A 401k does that? No, 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 uh, no. About no pension the defined does. benefit yeah, plans okay. that is uh, presently uh, uh, exist in Illinois. Do you see a migration toward a defined contribution plan uh, based on what you said? Eventually uh, we would move over to a defined contribution plan rather than defined benefit. I, 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 think, I think the best answer to that question is the two parts. Um, I think the best we can do right now, what's politically tenable and what's right for people that have been in a system for X amount of years and our public employees and have uh, forsaken a career in the private sector in order to serve the public is this cash balance plan. I think asking to go to a straight defined contribution plan for state retirement vehicles is, is, is not, it won't get the requisite number of votes that it would need. And on top of that, there's a lot of us that feel that 401ks were not designed to be pure retirement vehicles. I have a 401k. I understand that um, you know they're they're certainly better for the employer, but 
um, I think the cash balance plan, when, when people take a really good look at it and realize how, how good of a hybrid it is, well, well you, you're, you're, Mr. Um, Moon, you'll, you'll really appreciate that it may be the middle ground that we're looking for. Well, I hope this is a massive reality check because I think that, that in the last few years they've been counting on 8% appreciation yeah. per year. And how many people are getting 8% right now? Uh, uh. <laughs> it's, it's not happening. So I, so, I agree with you. So um, and, and I hope there are more of you. I didn't Very bring good. up one quick point about the shift. It's important to note this is not this is not retroactive. This is normal cost going forward. We will not ever ask this board, and no one would, I would never support going back in time. So I just wanted to make that point. Go ahead, Gary, Gary, isn't the reason why the pension is, is funded by the state is the fact that as a district and a district's employer, our hands are tied into that we have to offer the pension to the employees. By by virtue of by virtue of statute. Yeah. yeah. So to so that's the reason why. So uh, all, I'm, I don't want you. You don't need to. Sure. So I think you really need to tie the flexibility for the employer to offer options if you're going to force down a sure. cost that we can't control. Sure. I think that's a valid. That's a valid. Including a defined contribution plan. That's a valid. Because uh, you're talking about us having to. You know, we're taking on the burden, yeah. but we have no control over that burden. Un that's understood, and that's a valid criticism of the plan. I certainly could take that back to uh, the sponsors. Yeah. So I mean, you, there's two districts that have the pensions, that manage the pension. One is the city of Chicago, uh -huh. but you guys gave them control over right. their own pension. Right. And then there's one historically from uh, Dwight, or I don't know where the other one is. There's, I thought there was another one way back when. Well, I know that Chicago Teachers Pension System, the Chicago Board of Education, is responsible for their own But you also fund them some money for pensions, is my understanding. I... Yeah, there's... I thought I saw a contribution about $10 million or so. I, I think the general them. dialogue about Chicago versus the rest of the state is how much we subsidize education as a whole for them. Right. Is it composed to their pension? I mean, I, right. I, think, I think there's... Their, their contribution on the... Um, we get... 850 per pupil, they're getting over 4,000 per pupil is my calculation. And, I, and, and again, Gary, that's just really a, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, w I would be lying to you if I said you're the first person to say, if you guys are going to do this, you simply have to change the way GSA is calculated. How can you possibly expect suburban districts to absorb the shift and keep the current formula? I, it's a really good, that's a really good point. Because we penalize the taxpayers, if they fund more in local property taxes, sure. that's a deduction off of the state contribution. Understood. I yeah. agree. So given this fact that we now are going to be shared with an unfunded mandate, how can you talk to school districts like ourselves, and there are a lot more around here, who are tight financially, don't have an opportunity to really go back out to the community and ask for money through via referendum? that they're going to be able to fund this. So your comment is that I'm going to take out of education, uh, out of the state budget, and that's why I'm fixing up this pension. But really, you're taking out of our, pension, our, our educational budget because we need to find a way to get the money there to cover the, this mandate that we just received from the state. But, but with all due respect, Matthew, did, did, did this year, fiscal year 13, is going to be catastrophically bad to fiscal year 12 in terms of a decrease in education funding. And you don't you will be going is? to the voters. You will be going to the voters, one way or the other. And and I'm not breaking any bad. I, I'm not trying to be flip about that or, or or try to tell you something in in order to be an alarmist. But we the payment is going up to seven billion dollars this year. So that's another billion dollars that we have to find out of GRF, and it's going to come from education. So. We can either fix the public pension system in a way that makes the most sense, or we can say to you, there's even less money than there was last year. Ergo, you're, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not, I would be lying if I said I was an expert on your finances, but my, my guess is if we cut it significantly, you're going to have to go back to the voters again. So there's no way to avoid that unless we come up with a way to fix this and this problem 
and on top of that, deal with um, your deal with your ability to uh, to adjust to the to the change. In uh, May, we had our financial advisor or PMA come in and talk to us, and the deal that was shown to us from the pension plan was that it was going to be one percent over seven uh, seven or six years, with the first year uh, being rebated, the money's being rebated back from the state to cover that payment. <coughs> in this pe program that you're talking about right now, is there any monies coming back to the school district starting the first or second year? I don't think so. I think the I, 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 I would reserve answering that until I would have the bill in front of me, and I can certainly get Kevin that answer. But um, I will tell you, there's significant, significant discussion about in the early years of the of the phase in, making it as painless as possible. So um, whether that's a rebate or simply delaying the phase in until we see if if um, the market improves or if um, there's a way to adjust PTEL. I, 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 I'm, that's why I said before, it's important for, there's Representative Biss, Representative Neckritz, myself, um, I'm trying to think of the other suburban lawmakers on, that were co-sponsors of the bill. We are fully, fully cognizant of the, of the, of the limb we are out on doing this and ergo, we need to do make sure everything we we do everything we can to, to make this as painless as possible, and and, and be partners with you, uh, board members and, and school districts to the best we can. Well, I'd suggest there's an easy way to make it. One, one thing is, part of the problem with it, and you were here the last time, is the legislature's got to step up, be honest, and explain it, instead of burying, you know, oh, we made a mistake in the past and all this, and make it clear to people. One way you could address it is you could, when you pass it, if you're going to shift the cost, you allow us to automatically adjust, uh, like we had our hearing today, our uh, <coughs> property tax to cover the cost without having to go to the voters on it. I think. Because that at least, in, in, in take the blame for it. I, I think that's a really good idea. You know, it, it, I got to tell you, it bothers me, like for Gary, you know, smart guy, been on the school board two years, but everybody in Springfield didn't think, oh, the reason it's done this way is because the state sets the pension plan? No, 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 that's not what I said. Oh. Let's be clear on what I, I mean, I want to be clear on what I said. What, what we said was when, when, why is the employer contribution of teachers' pensions covered by the state of Illinois? And the, and the, and the answer is, because in the Great Depression, when these funds were being set up in the 20s and 30s, the state was the only one that was able to ensure that it had enough of the money and enough of the ability to borrow to cover those those okay. co those payments. That's that's why it's happening. But what you know, what we've, we're we're moving along here. We're moving along here, and under no system does it make sense for a third party. I mean, if there's small business owners on this on this board. It doesn't make any sense for a third party to be responsible for your direct negotiation with the teacher. Well, we can't negotiate right. that. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. I keep hearing yeah. that. It's your cost. You do it. You, we have no right or authority to make any kind of change to this pension because the state sets the standards for it. We can't go in the next union negotiation and say defined we're going to we're going to change to a defined contribution defined benefit. The law doesn't allow it. So that's so it's so such a it bad and let me finish Gary please it's such a bad analogy and that's why I'm saying be honest to people sure. it's it's apples and oranges like there never was before because if I own a business I can negotiate whatever I want with them we can't so your your point is Springfield sets the rules but you're stuck cutting the deal yeah, absolutely. there's and no I, deal to I, cut we're, and, stuck. we're, we're stuck we're stuck paying and my for it. and my rebuttal to you is that's why it's important for me to come before the board and to and to take back um, what what you're saying to the sponsors and say, hey, this is what this is what needs to be done. And I will tell you, the two ideas you just floated. I, I think I what I heard you say roughly is men or you or Gary say is a men PTEL, yeah. or, or deal with PTEL in a way that makes sense for you to to negotiate the best possible deal. And another idea that was floated to me on the labor side was a dedicated levy for, for, the, pop, for the purposes of employer contribution. Whatever, something like that, because 
it, 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 we're still going to have to deal with the fact that there's a dedicated levy for that and we need money for others. The taxpayers aren't going to be happy about it. Right. But if, if we didn't need a levy for another person, or a lot of school districts don't, why put the burden on them to have to go to the taxpayers and, and a vote to approve this? And what if it gets rejected? Then the shifting of the pension to us is going to cut other programs. And the last thing that bothers me more than anything else is how the funding is done so different in different areas. You know, I got to tell you, and I grew up in Chicago, my brothers are policemen, my parents, my dad was a policeman, my mom was his teacher. I went to Chicago Public Schools, but when Rahm Emanuel sets up there, we pay our own pension fund. And you look, we get 8% of our funds from state and federal. The city, according to their last report, Court gets 53% of their funds from state and federal. Let me tell you, you want to give us 53%, we'll stop asking to cover the pension because we could cover it easily. One way to do it is shift some of the, put some more money to the suburban. Our taxpayers have, they pay enough taxes. Yeah. Why do we have to pay more taxes? In other words, the suburban schools in particular, and I don't want to take away down states, okay. we are funding the Chicago public school system because you take the money from us and you give it to them. I mean, it should be some kind of fair thing of let them pay their share out of the uh, local property taxes. And if you did that, our taxpayers are going to be a lot happier too. So I mean, I, the, you know, and the last thing is it, it's still kind of a Band-Aid approach, isn't it? Because the one thing with the system also, no matter how we fund it, is the the different prorations that everybody pays, where it's the employees, the employer, the state, however you do it, you, you made the, a statement earlier that, you know, if you were a private uh, company, you'd do it this way, and Dan pointed out how you would yeah. c calculate it. It's still not done, like, on an actuarial basis, right? So if you're doing flat percentages, it may not cover the cost of the pensions. For well, that given year, I I, th I think you're I think I mean I, I would argue I think I would argue and I think the pension funds would argue objectively we we do use actuarial analyses but the problem as it's been historically is we paint a rosy picture at the cost of telling our members the truth and that's why partly why we're in this we're in this mess we're in yeah but if a private company had a pension plan and it was overseen but they have to do a calculation every year to see if they're fully funded. And if they're not fully funded, they have to fund it. Well, Every year you know if you're full. It, aside from the fact of whether you're paying for what you should, sure. you also could figure out whether that amount of payment would fully fund the pension. Well, That's why I'm saying this approach still isn't going to get to the fact that over you know, 10, 20 years from now, even if you pass the cost down to the local school districts, that the pensions could be underfunded again. My response to that, Tim, is IMRF, is the best funded of the systems in Illinois right now. And the reason it's the best funded of the systems is because they have an ironclad guarantee. If they don't, if the payment's not made every year by the uh, employer side, they go to court and get a writ. Th that's in our bill. So it's not the answer you're looking for, I understand, but the, I think the broader answer is accountability exists in this bill because, you know, the, the what really got us in this jam was the, the pension holidays Bogoyevich did in the early to, in the mid, early to mid two thousands, coupled with the market just, just getting destroyed. So he was able to avoid making the payments, and the labor, you know, what it was sat back and you know wasn't unable to prevent it, and that's things just spiraled out of control. Your point that um, you know these funds are never going to be fully funded because the money is never going to what i hear what i'm hearing you say is we got to make sure that the money is always put in is well taken and i would argue there's an accountability structure in there to make sure that the money i, I was trying paid. to make a different point okay. my point is even if everybody paid let's let's say illinois paid every dollar all along those pension could still be underfunded because but, they and a, they with the interest rates changing on every year, sure. you'd have to do a new calculation, and that is not how our pensions sure. are calculated here. Well, we can uh, we can aim for a certain level, and cover if we aim for a certain level, we can cover if everyone retired tomorrow. That's the goal of. I mean, I, I Tim, I wish I could give you a better answer, but that's the 
but this is the best answer I, I can offer. That's so, fine. Thank you. So pushing the cost down to all these districts. Yeah. I mean, recognize that it's not only going to affect the high school here, but we yes. have all the local right. elementary school districts. So to a taxpayer here, it's compounded between two districts that they're residing in. Need to tie it with reform of the pension, including a defined contribution, so that we have flexibility in what we can offer our employees. If you want us to manage the dollars now, then let us manage the benefits we offer our employees. I, I will take that message back. I would, I would strongly, strongly urge, if you haven't already, to, to take a detailed look at the cash balance plan. I, I think it's. I think. I think if your concern is flexibility, and being able to make the deal you prefer for that protects the taxpayers, tier two cash balance. It's it's a strong, strong option. I mean, I, 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 but I'll, hearing what you said, I'll take it back to the sponsor. So do me a favor. I have a comment. Yeah. <clears throat> As school board members, we are aware that Illinois funds education. 50th out of all 50 states. It, it is insulting when you have these discussions in Springfield to think that we would assume any of this responsibility when the state has already abdicated its responsibility to fund a public education. Do you think, Laura, that we, do you think we don't realize the travesty we're causing by underfunding education? We are funded at the lowest level in the entire United States, this state is. And then we are funded inequitably, depending about where you live. And when all 400 delegates, <coughs> half of the delegates meet for this meeting every year, we know the inequities in this city, and Chicago takes the lion's share of public dollars. And this tiny little district funds this school it's at, crazy. what, but 93% of the funds, are we at 86%? So 86% of our budget is funded on the backs of the people that live in this district. And now you want the people in this district to pick up what the state should be funding? I, I would repeat myself. Do you think that me and my colleagues who have voted the last two years to cut education funding significantly, substantively, unprecedentedly, don't realize that we are underfunding education? I mean, I, your point is well taken, and, and it's, I understand, but with all due respect, I, 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 I'll, I won't be repetitive to what I said to uh, Chair per Chairman Cindy. It's because of that dramatic underfunding that we are that we are in the position that we are in where we have to act i i i understand that the taxpayers uh, this is a hard pill to swallow and i and i'm i'm going to go back and and relay the concerns but it, you know i i would repeat myself in saying that we are it is only going to get worse if we don't address this particular problem it's only going to get worse. There is no due respect when it is the state constitutional right of a student to receive a public education, and the state repeatedly abdicates its role and responsibility. Parents don't have any more money. And so the state has to start making cuts, stop voting pay increases, and start making cuts in other areas. But, but I... I we, we cut education funding $200 million. We cut across the board 10%. We, um, this notion that we're not cutting in Springfield, I'm sorry, but it's flatly untrue. We are doing massive, massive budget reforms in an effort to get, we, for the last two years, we have passed unprecedented budgets in Springfield where members went line by line with an Excel spreadsheet on a, on a, on a whiteboard and we went through each program that the state funds and asked whether it was necessary and whether we could afford it going forward. And for the last two years, the idea, we, 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 have, we have made sure that expenses were less than revenues. We have cut and cut and cut. I'm sorry, but the, the time for saying we need to cut more is over. We need fundamental changes That's to the way we do That's what you're asking us to do. We have laid off staff members two years in a row. How do you expect us to carry on the business of school without teachers? 
I don't. I, but I that's don't. what you're forcing us to do when you ask more money of us. I'm not asking more money of you. I, I, what I'm trying to do is reform a, a system that's broken. And I, I, I understand your concerns, and I'll take them back to the sponsors. But, um, you know, I, 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 I appreciate what you're saying, but we, we, are, we are doing this because the pension payment is crowding out our ability to help you with funding education. So, Representative Zalewski, I have two more items that sure. I need you to address. Second of all is, where is our $8.9 million? Really good question. Which I heard we removed up the ladder and now... I didn't bring my checkbook last time and I didn't bring it this time either. Um, it is my top priority to get uh, that resolved. The governor wants to do a capital construction program in January. I mean, I've, I'm prepared to inquire about whether um, your, your grant could be participating in that, but it's at the top of my agenda and Kevin and I continue to work on that aggressively to resolve it. And secondly, uh, we ask, I've asked this every year since you've been here, <laughs> is that we looked out this year because of the We sent them out on time. We sent the bills out on time. I sent the tax bills out finally. But that is a, uh, an abnormal Outlier. activity, Outlier. not a normal activity. Outlier. And a normal activity, because now you're throwing more money at us to spend, <laughs> is what is the state going to do for late real estate payments, which will force districts and taxing bodies in Cook County only, just in Cook County, which you are representative of, yeah. to be able to, to get tax anticipation warrants, which comes out of their budget also. So, Matt, I think the first answer, the best answer to your question is I think President Preckwinkle has made it for her, um, her mission in life to make sure those bills get out on time. Uh, but that being said, um, if, if, if you're you're giving me permission, I will refile the bill that I filed a couple of years ago to, to address that concern. Okay. All right, anything else, John? Um, I just have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, thanks for coming by again. I'm not going to beat up on you. This I, uh, isn't I think you got up a tough, on me. I mean, you got a tough job. There's, yeah. I agree with you, as Blagojevich was, um, he really didn't do his job or show leadership. It's unfortunate, but now we have to fix it. Why not have the, uh, you know, the, the Illinois pension recipients pay more? I know you said 2%. Theoretically, you could fund it if, you know, they paid whatever, 5 6% more. It's a, it's a really good question. A um, couple of answers to it. Uh, I think the actuaries tell us over and over again um, is it's the COLA, the, the, the cost of living adjustment, is where the lion's share of the money is. That they, what they will tell you is, Increasing the contribution to five or six percent has 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 a negligible, which I find stunning to believe. I mean, but I'm not an actuary, but they continue to they continue to state emphatically, cola adjustment is what's really necessary to 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 wrap our arms around the problem. Um, the second um, the second thing is again, and I and I don't mean to say this in a in a belittling way, but I think when, when we're talking about increasing the contribution, I think personally, members of labor will tell you personally, you know, not their leadership, but personally, that they can stomach an increase in the contribution um, if, if it means continuation of their current plan, but they don't know how much they could stomach. So the question is what we thought would be an adequate amount to, to help stabilize the fund without losing support for the bill. So that's why we came up with 2%. Okay. I, I, I have one final question. John has still There's an obvious constitutional yeah, question here. Yeah. No. So yeah, if, you, if we do this cost shift, would that be separate from the, the other part? And you know, Because this is going to go to court if it passes. Yeah. Would the well, cost shift be implemented? Regardless of the other part of the bill, or do, can you separate? Well, it? it's written in 6258, uh, so my belief it would be included in the bill. To, the, to your constitutionality question, um, there's, believe it or not, there's different di opinions, um, but our opinion is the court, Supreme Court, would have to make a public policy judgment that it's in the state's best interest to fix the pension crisis. Um, we, you know, we we can we can play with this idea of offer acceptance consideration or modification of a contract, 
But at the end of the day, if are, a lot of people feel if the court's going to throw it out, they're going to throw it out. And if they're going to let us fix it, they're going to let us fix it. And, you know, doing the offer acceptance consideration just became cumbersome. So I personally think we pass a bill and we let the court do what it should do, which is decide on the law. And they either make a public policy judgment that it's in the best interest for us to do this, or they say, you know, the impairment clause is the impairment clause and it's unconstitutional. And then we go back and we try to amend the Constitution, which there's just, it's never going to get. I mean, we couldn't get 60% of the voters to agree to a three fifths majority this time. So I don't know how we can possibly amend the impairment clause. And I don't know that a lot of us would want to. I think that might be a bridge too far. Thanks. I, uh, I read uh, the draft of your proposal, and thank you for bringing it forth. But I didn't see something that uh, concerns me. Has there been any attempt to rein in the qualification of recipients or potential recipients for either credit or benefits for teachers retirement benefits, teachers retirement system benefits? Um, and I cite a, a case that's very close to us. We have an advocacy organization called IASB. And our, our uh, executive director is getting credit for TRS as the executive director, even though this is a private advocacy organization. That, to me, is an actuarial burden on us, eventually. I think that, that it's gotten out of hand. Is there any sense that, that you're going to respond be more restrictive on who gets benefits for pensions in the I, future. I, Dan, I'll be honest with you. I, this is the you're the first person that's raised that particular concern with me. Well, I dig deep on this. Okay. <laughs> so we know it. Um, I, I'd love to get more information from you and get you an answer. I'll give it I, to I, you. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. I can reach out through Kevin and try to get your email address. If that's okay. I, I don't. I don't I'll give you one right here. Okay, sounds good. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to answer I wanna that ask question. Another question. Okay. Yeah. We just let the parents know that we're almost. We'll be wrapping up <laughs> shortly, and then we'll get the student you guys recognition. Can, yeah. I just want to let know the students that have social studies or political government, American government, you can get credit for this. All right. <laughs> Representative, I have to come back to one point that I asked earlier, and a follow up to uh, what Laura asked. You said several times we cut 200 million out of education. You didn't cut 200 million out of education at all. You shifted 200 million out of education from the state's budget to our budget. Yeah. When we make a cut, there's 10 teachers gone, and we're not spending money on them. And we know that, and our taxpayers know that. When the state talks about cutting, it's it's shifting a lot. It's funny money. If the state's cutting, they're simple. You know, it's this. We, and again, I don't know what these numbers are. We have, we pay legislatures 120 grand. We're going to pay them 100 grand. We have 10,000 policemen. We're going to have 9,000 policemen. We have, you know, 100 buildings. We're going to have 80 buildings. Those are cuts. Yeah, what the what the state has done is taking part of what was in their budget, saying they cut it shifted it on to us all our school districts and these taxpayers rather than paying so their income tax now or their state fees or whatever they're going to have to pay what you cut to up shifted to us through their property taxes I mean, and, and i struggle with this how the, we can keep coming out and having our legislature say we cut something and, and it just is disturbing to well me. i'm sorry it's disturbing uh, my rebuttal is I mean, I heard a few minutes ago, uh, I think Laura said it, so late, you guys laid off teachers last year, right? Yes, so two how, years in a row. If, if, the, if the money didn't come from the state or if it didn't come from the board, how does that make a difference in terms of what the cut was? How does it, how does it matter if, if we didn't fund that teacher or you, you didn't, didn't fund, fund a teacher before? Because you only well, fund... But you guys, you guys have a GSA requirement. And we fund we fund per pupil, don't we? I mean, do we do we not use GSA to fund per pupil? Under under nine hundred dollars per pupil versus In Chicago, which district. is over forty four hundred. <laughs> so I guess again, my point. I mean, well, but when you we, say you cut, all you did is took that line item out of your budget, 
and either we had less revenue so it nets out or you took the revenue and did something else with it so we our budget did not change when you stop paying more money we're getting less from the state we have to take more money from well right now out of reserve and at some point from our taxpayers to pay what you say you cut all you did we stop paying a bill and shifted it on to our taxpayers. So if we cut, we cut the governor's vetoes on about eighty-six million dollars in prison stood. We cut them. We got to close them down. That's that's cost. That's a cut. That's saving. Uh, you, you stop running the prison, have people there. You're not spending money on it. So if we cut across the board, I mean, I, I Tim, I I guess I understand the the the, the criticism. Um, and I, and I, you know, to, to your point about education funding getting downshifted to the locals, I get it. But you know, if I if I was over if I overreacted, I'm sorry. But but this notion that we're sitting down there and we're pretending to cut but not really cutting is just not it's not accurate. We are going through these budgets Look, year after simple. year. Show me the 200. You said you cut 200 million. Show me how it came. Which part came out of the expenses we have? That's cutting because we pay for the education. In order to do that, you would have to show, here's the $200 million we paid. What did we cut? Now, you cut some regional directors or something. It's a pit. We got, we got it you could show we, that. We got you rid of a lot of mandated categoricals. Okay, but, but most of it, anything else that has no impact, it just is less money we have to spend, and we still have to... Cover our I, I understand. Okay, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this off a little bit because we can keep this discussion okay. going, and we got other okay. uh, people that are waiting to get in. It, so I appreciate the board's opportunity. Um, can I have ninety back? seconds? <laughs> right, ninety <laughs> seconds. <laughs> we, give, we give visitors three minutes. I'll try to do it in half that time. <laughs> Go back to Springfield and tell them, parents, students, the board, we're scared about this sure. big unknown. Duly noted. Ask them for some kind of mechanism. That we can get the money without having to go to referendum. Sure. On my other issue that I always bring up, you know, <laughs> a traffic safety issue yeah. is like getting students from here to North Riverside. Yeah. I understand that there's federal traffic safety money out there, and there's this capital plan, and IDOT is supposed to be doing something on First Avenue in the future. We'd like to get something along First Avenue on the yeah. west side. We'll work with the zoo to get something to get up to 31st Street and then get up to 26th Street. And it's not just for the students. <coughs> the, the economic <coughs> engine in this area is the zoo. Mm -hmm. People can flow down on their bikes to the zoo. I personally would like to take my bike on a safe route and go up to that big, those big box stores. One of them is kind of yeah. orange. And, and get there <laughs> on, on a safe route. Uh, zoo employees can use this. Uh, we can use the forest preserve more. And the existing stuff on First Avenue, the sidewalks are way too close to the street. It's just not safe. I'll stop there. Ninety seconds. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> Kevin and I are gonna. Uh, we are gonna do our best to get that money. Really, I, I, I that's enough, enough sir. Yeah, that's that's on my on my list of things. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Representative. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you, Kamluski.